Hello, it's Anthony Chung here from Amplify Trading in London. And due to, I would say, popular demand, I've been asked to do a lecture or a conversation about how I use Twitter for the benefit of trading and monitoring the news. Now, it's a question I get asked a lot uh, from a number of different people, all the way from uh, kind of institutional level traders, uh, desks at uh, bond desks, FX desks, hedge funds, uh, down to retail traders. Everyone kind of wants to know what's the kind of secret source that I use for, for monitoring Twitter. And, and really, once I go through this session, it's very much a case of a, a logical and quite a structured process in how to use that tool effectively to get the most out of it. And so there's a couple of things I can go over uh, and explore and share with you uh, I think I've been using Twitter now for the best part of uh, perhaps eight, nine years. Uh, always until more recently joining Amplify uh, just for the purpose of monitoring. Now obviously I tweet a little bit more myself. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm the head of market analysis here at Amplify Trading. I was in the same position previously for a company called Ransquark, which is one of the world's leading uh, squawk companies. Uh, my job then is to monitor um, financial news and give insight uh, analysis in a real-time fashion upon things of which I'm seeing. So that can be uh, things that are coming out off of traditional news wires like uh, your normal terminal systems or can be things like Twitter for example where you can capture things like rumors and so on which we're going to discuss. So that's what we're going to talk about and going straight into things why do we use Twitter? Now, now let's just build the scene first of, of why exactly use Twitter when you can use a Bloomberg or Reuters, these kind of professional systems which people will pay thousands and thousands of dollars for every month. Now, the point being here is that um, the guys at the big institutions will be using those platforms, but you know, those who are not familiar with it, a Bloomberg's news function is just one small part of that, that terminal. I mean, it's quite a powerful tool in terms of its analytics. Uh, it's historical data sets that you can look at, uh, as well as things like a chat function, pricing functions, and so on and so forth. The point being is, let's say Bloomberg has around 3,000 financial journalists worldwide, and they're releasing these news stories all of the time. Reuters might be doing the same, Wall Street Journal, the FT. These are your traditional financial news services. Now, one of the restrictions that they can have is that they can only really report authenticated and genuine news, which means then by default they can be quite slow on certain things. For example, what I've tried to do here is, is give you a, a kind of overview of why Twitter can kind of fill that gap and how it does so. First of all, speed. Now, one of the things here, and it kind of fits in lockstep really with the one on the right, which is rumors. Let's say Brexit has been a massive issue ever since it was initiated in the summer of 2016. And every time we get these kind of uh, roadmaps of when there's a political event that's happening, like a vote in parliament, for example, you see this big spike in traffic uh, and, the, and the pound becomes much more sensitive to movement and responsive to headlines when they come out. Now, one of the things there is, is that these journalists, and if you think about a journalist by default, what is their singular objective as a, as a journalist? Now, what they want is basically to break stories first. If the guy at BBC or can beat the girl at the ITV or Channel 4 and so on, they become much more um, famous for that. They become much more well-followed, more respected. Uh, it's kind of the first out with the scoop is the king in that world. And the new format of delivering that, now that news dissemination has evolved so much over the period of the last decade, is Twitter. So I remember when I started in markets in 2006, literally you had to wait for the truck drop off to pick up your newspapers fresh in the morning and read them and then to find what was the important headline of the day. Markets were then open and react. But markets in 2020 now uh, move radically different. Now it's a case of as soon as Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, says something, a journalist is on it and tweets it immediately. And financial news now, in a way of which prices 
or trades are executed, it's not just humans point click anymore. There's algorithms, there's other systems automated that can respond to these types of keywords, for example. And that means then the underlying story now is almost redundant. What actually moves markets in a very short term intraday environment is a piece of news, a headline comes out and the market spikes and so on. So speed is critical. The ability for Twitter um, being unauthenticated in a way means that it can circumvent the restrictions of the editorial sign off process, meaning that news comes rapid. Now, obviously, one of the key things which we can discuss later is also authenticity is key. How do you know what you're seeing is genuine uh, is one of the then things you'll need to tackle when using Twitter. But what it does offer is great access to speed and rumors. So with that Brexit example, I was uh, suggesting when uh, there's whispers in the halls of Westminster, you're going to hear it directly from your Laura Koonsbergs, your Robert Pestons, your Paul Brands from ITV, for example. They will be tweeting it way before then it becomes on the six o'clock news, for example. Uh, the other thing that, that Twitter is, is so good is accessibility. That's why I've put access there, is the idea that um, you can just have this on your mobile. Uh, so when you're going about your business, when you're, for me, I'm on the commute into uh, the city of London every morning, I can just jump on my, my phone, I can look at who I follow, because who I follow is a curated feed of bespoke individuals, hand-picked, that talk about the things that are relevant for me. Now for me, I monitor global macro, so I'm looking out for people commenting on these big top level things like the trade war or Brexit and Trump and so on. Now by the time I can say that I get into the office, which is about 20 minutes on the train, then I'm pretty much ready to go. Uh, I haven't looked at a Bloomberg, I've not looked at Reuters, I've not even looked at the charts and I already pretty much know what they're gonna look like. That's how powerful it can become. And, and certainly if you're a student perhaps watching this video, what a great way to be able to just learn on the fly between lectures, between traveling on a train or on the bus. Uh, it's a great way where you don't have to go through that arduous process of reading the FT back to, you know, back to back, cover to cover. It's just a case of you're seeing every tweet is adding value to your understanding and your awareness of what's going on in the market in a real time sense. And the other thing then that, as I've described, as to the knowledge, the accumulation of knowledge. Um, and that's one of the things where for me, someone, if you uh, watch our morning briefings that we deliver on our YouTube channel, um, do subscribe to them because they'll really help enhance your fundamental understanding of the market. So the overall global macro approach that we have here at Amplify Trading. But people often look at me and go, out, you know, why do you know about you know, labor strikes in South Africa and how that impacts, say, platinum prices. But then how do you know about um, the copper mines in Chile, in Escondida? Uh, but then what? how do you know about UK politics? Now, these things aren't, you know, I haven't just magic them up out of thin air. I, I know these things through having gone through years of experience. Uh, and Twitter definitely helps accelerate that that kind of knowledge bank that I think you need to be an effective global macro trader or to have a enhanced understanding of market fundamentals. But bear in mind, I have been doing this since you know, 2006. So uh, my ability to, to maintain and absorb information has certainly been improved by the way I've been trained and developed over time. A few other things then here. Um, one of the things I wanted to show you is this, and some of you may be familiar with this, um, it's a story I often tell because it's one that resonates for me very clearly in my mind because I remember the day uh, very vividly. Um, so I used to run, as I said, a, a, a real-time news and analysis service. So my clients were uh, these guys who were trading large size in the market and they were paying us for real-time coverage. Now, this was back in 2012. I think was when I first started to table the idea to my colleagues about we should be looking at Twitter um, more uh, with more focus. We should have a designated person looking at Twitter full time with a kind of four screen setup all organized 
into monitoring different things because what I had I had seen through kind of back testing was that over the course of 12 months it was yielding very good results for finding things from rumors about single stock information to potential terrorism alerts things like that uh, it was coming way before traditional news wires so we got the go-ahead and we had a chap sat there and he was his job was to just look at Twitter now arguably back then there wasn't anywhere near as much activity perhaps or quality as there is today in uh, 2019 2020 uh, but the, there were elements of you could see where this was going and and what happened in mid April 2013 you might remember is when those two brothers conducted uh, that horrific Boston Marathon bombing uh, and what typically happens after a high terrorist um, event of that nature is that global terrorist statuses kind of go on high alert uh, and literally just a week later we had uh, this tweet. I know it's a bit small to see, but let me read it out to you. This was the Associated Press AP News. They basically tweeted, breaking news, two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. This was the genuine Associated Press Twitter account. It has around 11 million odd followers. So this was legit as far as we could see it. So we obviously reported the information but the beauty of this was is that not everyone was looking at Twitter at the time and obviously we had a designated guy who was just there looking at Twitter and he immediately was able to comment on this and capture what you can see here which was an immediate spike in US equities to the downside uh, and then what transpired in this event was actually the Associated Press it was the actual account but it had been hacked uh, and by hacking it then they had put out an illegitimate tweet the tweet got removed the market reversed but I remember it quite clearly it was several minutes before Bloomberg even mentioned this piece of news they were so far behind the curve it was unreal now for our clients at the time when I was in my previous job uh, it was a it was a great opportunity to trade if you were an aggressive type of trader and you're willing to commit get into the market and that type of volatility then you had a massive time arbitrage to be able to execute those trades and um, what happened here though was because of this one singular event Twitter then became no longer this kind of thing that a few people looked at to an absolute common mainstay of a setup of nearly every proprietary trader uh, in the world if you were looking at trading intraday uh, in that fashion. One of the big things then that, that gets asked then is the credibility of these news sources. Um, so people like Bloomberg, Reuters, FT, BBC and so on, all the national newspapers, uh, most of those journalists are in fact encouraged to tweet. Now, don't get me wrong, people like Bloomberg are not going to release a scoop on Twitter uh, because that would be counter to the whole reason that people pay tens of thousands of dollars for a Bloomberg terminal. But things like Times, Telegraph um, definitely can offer some insight because other than just the, a publication every once in a while, perhaps on a weekly basis in the weekend press, journalists can be quite active throughout the day so definitely these are, are good sources of credible information less credible ones then Twitter blog sites another blog site a very infamous one you might be aware of in the financial community is one called zero hedge now zero hedge I think their work is absolute quality um, obviously you need to take it a little bit with an awareness of their overall kind of spin on markets being somewhat you know sensationalist or quite bearish but ultimately they're putting out some really insightful information uh, information from different banknotes from different economists analysts things that otherwise from a, from a retail traders point of view could be quite difficult to get your hands on and also helps give you quite a high level uh, an intellectual level of looking at how markets are viewed by seasoned professionals how to verify then a Twitter account and this is the kind of checklist that generally I would go through uh, in order to have that process of can I trust and rely on what this Twitter account is saying and here you've got who do they work for how many followers do they have 
Have there, has the account been officially verified as per the uh, logo you can see on the right hand side? What type of content has been tweeted previously? Who follows the account in question? And what is the context of the tweet? Now, one of the things I wanted to show you to put this checklist almost into action is this. Um, some of you might remember this, certainly if you're watching in the UK, you, you probably will. Um, but you know, this was December of 2016, I think it was. And I remember it because uh, we have a bit of a shutdown here at Amplify Trading between Christmas and New Year. So uh, I was hanging out with some friends. Uh, it, was, it was shortly after Christmas. So I wasn't in the office, but markets were open. Uh, and I get this frantic phone call off one of my former colleagues. And he's going, Anthony, Anthony, the queen is dead. I'm going to short the pound. How much should I short the pound? And I was kind of like, whoa, 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 just hold on, hold on a second. Um, why would you want to short the pound was my first question. Um, you know, quite frankly, if the, if the queen is dead, that's not going to have any impact on the pound was my initial view. Uh, and he was arguing that, yeah, but consumer confidence will be hit and spending will be down. And I was like, look, you're talking way too small a value and too long a period of time for traders to be hitting that in an intraday kind of move. So I wouldn't even worry about it. He puts the phone down. I then go on my phone, I go on Twitter, and I just type in the queen is dead to see what is happening. Now, stay with me. This is a genuine example. So I find this tweet. This was actually the tweet that I found. Now, let me talk you through two things. One is what is wrong with this Twitter account? What to you, looking at it, makes you think there's something not quite right about it? So let me walk you through it. For one, they're following 225 accounts. And two, they've got just over 1,000 followers. So remember, this is trying to suggest that this is the main BBC News UK Twitter account and it's got a thousand followers. That to me is alarm bells immediately. The other thing is they've made a typo. They've put UK with a lowercase k. They've also got an, uh, a random I after the UK in the actual handle of the account. And the context of the tweets. If you actually looked at the context of the tweets, although you can see this really high res image of the queen with a very legitimate sounding title, the other tweets were of this person's dog, what they had for breakfast. So it was immediately obvious to me that this was this was fake. Now, the, the, how you can kind of read between the lines here and eliminate this type of um, illegitimate news is people were literally no one was clicking on the profile all that was happening was the tweet in itself so if you were just to imagine the bottom half of this page there were a whole load of people just resharing retweet 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 and so when you look at it it's almost validated that it's genuine by the fact that it was getting thousands of retweets per second so it had gone like wildfire and people just took it for what it was that it was genuine so this is where again a little bit of understanding of knowing when markets can be manipulated by these types of things but then also having the the foresight to be able to verify the account not believe just what you're seeing it's kind of one of those things like when i talk to our traders about uh, data for example never take a piece of data in isolation You've got to put it into context because otherwise it can be misleading if it's just a singular piece of information. Uh, and it's the same thing here with Twitter. So again, all I did then to carry that and conclude the story is I just basically said the Queen's not dead. This is a fake account. And as you can see here, I woke up the next morning on the, the morning of the 30th of December uh, and I was literally the front page of every national newspaper um, in the world, the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, the Sun newspaper, the most widely read newspaper in, in Britain. And this wasn't because, you know, I'm anyone particularly unique and how this is transferable to, to trading 
is that, you know, I've seen the head of the German Bundesbank's Twitter account falsified and someone's tried to tweet to move the market. And in fact, it did move the euro. This is one important thing to be aware of. Just because it's fake, if enough people believe it, it can move the market. The idea then is about the longevity you'd want to be in a position of risk in a trade on the back of that type of information. What happened with the Bundesbank one was that the actual central bank had to come out and issue a formal press statement to say that that was not um, actually them. It was a made up uh, hoax account. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense about the authenticity process of this. This is pretty much the most important slide uh, that I'm gonna share with you. And this is my, my process. How do I find the best people to follow on Twitter? And these are my kind of key bullet points that I've spent many years kind of refining. And so I'm gonna share them with you and hopefully you can learn to develop this into a really powerful tool for yourself. So one, explore your community. Now what I mean by this is when, you, when I follow someone on Twitter, let's say there's a guy called uh, James Smith. He's one of the developed um, FX market strategists at a European bank. I think his work is very good. I really like his analysis. I think he's right on point. So what I will do is I will find him on Twitter and I will follow him. That's great. That's step one. Step two then is if he works at a big financial institution, he is very much on point. He's got his finger on the pulse and he provides timely and useful information for me. My question then is when I go on his Twitter account, who does he follow? Who does he feel is good enough to make his shortlist of the people he would want to follow? And then I start unlocking this kind of spider's web of who's connected to who and then who people who I'd never even heard of start blipping up on the radar and I start looking at the context of their tweets and they're tweeting useful information all of the time. So who's connected to who in your network is a real important one. It's kind of the number one step that I would take. The other thing then is you're obviously going to start following quite a few people. So you've got to get organized. Now I'm going to share with you a free service called TweetDeck, which allows you to organize them by columns into structures in different lists. So basically you can categorize who you're following to make it much more orderly so you can, you can look at it and utilize it more effectively. Um, so creating lists is quite, quite key. A uh, common question I get is how many Twitter accounts can you follow in say one list? I would say maximum you wanna do is about 450, 500. I think if you go beyond that, then TweetDeck, which streams these tweets in real time, gets too fast. And so that's about optimum. Um, I'd say if you're more experienced and you can manage looking at more things, then perhaps you can go a little higher. But then I think it's about then breaking it up into more subject areas. Rather than having one list with everything, that's quite hard to manage. So how we used to do it was that each column had a specific purpose. One might be the transportation hubs within central London to identify if there are any terror alerts or suspect packages and so on. Another might be people explicitly commenting on US stocks. Another one might be someone talking specifically uh, about FTSE companies. So these are all how you would, you would organize it. Understand what type of news you are looking for. You know, one thing, uh, again, to be crystal clear, you're not using Twitter to capture, say, economic data when it's released. You know, that's where you go to investing.com or Forex Factory. You can get that anywhere. What you're looking for are rumors. That's what's really powerful when it comes to Twitter. Now, with rumors, things like Brexit, again, would be a perfect one. When you know that there's a big meeting, or let's say the China-US trade war, there's a phase one meeting, a signing happening at X time, when do you think potential rumors might occur? Uh, without surprise, they occur right in the build up and run up to the meeting, not a week before, but a day before. Kind of the same thing can happen with uh, central bank sources. So when Bloomberg release something like an ECB source comment, which is basically an informed person with close thinking of the central bank, 
uh, they will drop that in usually in the 24, 48 hours before the event in itself. That's when the market um, is most susceptible to that type of information. So again, I know kind of just through experience when I need to look for Twitter and when rumors might occur. So say with economic data, yes, I'm not looking for the release, but if there was gonna be a leak of data, for example, like ISM, ADP, non-farm payrolls, if it is gonna come, it's gonna come just before. And so therefore, I'd have a search criteria set up so I could see then if there's any leaks and rumors before things come out. Chicago PMI being a case in point. Anyone who does trade will know Chicago PMI comes out uh, to subscribers a few minutes before the official public release. And you can get it on Twitter way before uh, the likes of Financial Newswires will be releasing it. Look at who writes articles. So again, I'm spending a bit of time going through these points because these are the key ones. Who writes these articles? I mean, I always say this to people. Um, when you read the Wall Street Journal, for example, and you read a really interesting article, how often do you actually pay note to who wrote it? What's the person's name? And then cross-check it. Do they tweet? And lo and behold, they do, and fairly frequently, and of high quality information. So get in a habit of opening your mind to capturing you know this information people you know used to pay me a lot of money in my previous job as clients for me to think like this i'm constantly thinking of how can i get information and how can i get it as quickly as possible and how can i be more informed and how can i keep my clients more informed or the traders more informed um, so every time you read something you know, ask yourself that question. Who is writing this piece? And do they tweet? Are they worth following? Next is back test and fact find. I used to do this religiously every month. You know, and again, this is sounds like it's a lot of work, right? But you know, don't forget this is what my job was. And so again, I'm 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 kind of giving you the trade secrets a little bit, but here, what I would do is if someone, if it became well known that Twitter was the first port of call to break a piece of information, what I would do is I'd make a note of that and at the end of the day, I'd go onto the advanced search filters on Twitter and I would put in this exact kind of time frame of when the initial event happened. I'd then look back chronologically and identify who is the first person to break this information. And more often or not, it were people who perhaps I'd never even come across before. But then I would look at the context of their tweets, how often do they tweet, and I'd put everything together to then see whether or not there's someone worth adding into my list of people to follow. So it's not, you know, nothing, and I, I say this with full belief, there's no such thing as luck. Uh, it's all in the preparation. You've got to put yourself in luck's way for it to materialize and for you to benefit from it. You know, I spent a whole career doing that, working silly hours doing this type of thing because I had to be that edge for, for the traders. Uh, and so it all, you know, a lot of this back testing and doing the hard yards pays dividend in the end. The other thing is uh, continuously update and review the people you follow. People often, uh, and I get this, uh, I normally talk to traders when they're quite junior. They get quite excited about the prospects of what Twitter can bring, as you can tell by the things that I'm talking about, that the potential edge can be huge from a time perspective and execution point of view. But then they kind of add all these people and then they leave it. And that's not what I'm saying. It's an evolving thing. People are, you know, there's new people coming into the market, adding value. There's people who are already there who are, who are not tweeting enough, who are just cluttering your feed. Uh, subject matter in the market is changing. You know, whether it's Turkey, whether it's inversion of the yield curve, whether it's the repo rate spike that we had in 2019. You know, you want to be altering the feed to reflect the macro hierarchy of the subjects that are moving markets. So. Uh, change constantly, quality over quantity is what matters when it comes to this. And then, uh, this is another thing uh, I always used to do, and maybe not everyone's actually aware of this, but news in its local language comes out way quicker than it does in English. 
Now, if you were looking at Chinese press and Russian press, I'm going to pick those two because of the trade war that's been going on most recently in 2019, 2020, and then also Russia, Ukraine. Remember the annexation of Crimea in 2014? What I used to do was my first thought path was what are all the major newspapers in Russia and Ukraine? Now, that's an easy Google search. Once I go on there, then I then look at the actual websites in Russian. And what I used to see was when I put the Russian website and then its English trans, uh, its English version of the website, the Russian website was updating infinitely quicker. So it was almost like it would go up there and then get translated by an English speaking team to then go on the English version. And the same thing happens in China. So what I'm saying is I used to just rely on translation tools and read literally news in its local language. And I used to find massive time edge to get into stories way before their markets would react in terms of US, UK and European markets. So on TweetDeck, one of the systems I'll show you shortly, there is a auto translation function where you can look at tweets. So I'd always recommend if the subject matter is in a different language to English, then you should always follow it in its local language if you want to be quick and react to things in that manner. Now, with all this being said, it does sound like a lot of work, but this is how you can really take advantage and use Twitter if you're going to use it for trading purposes. The other way of doing this, of course, the shortcut is to get a Squawk service like uh, New Squawk, for example, and there they have designated people doing this for you 24 hours a day. Um, the other key thing, I mentioned this briefly um, earlier, so I won't spend too much time, but improving your fundamental knowledge. Uh, what, you're, what I find uh, is when the traders here do have it up, they spend a lot, of the, a lot of the time, they've got their trade set up, they've got their fundamental bias, their technical setup, they're just waiting for the trade. Now, while they're waiting for the trade, just having this kind of scrolling news feed of really quite relevant information about the broader macro environment, subconsciously almost, they've, they're developing their understanding of markets. They're reading about things that perhaps they didn't know about. And to be an effective headline trader in the intraday environment, which is a hard skill to master, you've got to have a real breadth of knowledge uh, to be able to action very quickly and have high conviction. And so having that awareness of your finger on the pulse is, is very key, and Twitter's very good at that. Trump tweets, you know, hopefully by now you can see it's not all about Donald Trump, although it is and will continue to be so when it comes to Twitter in 2020 as a main feature. And we know why is because Trump likes to use the platform of Twitter as his medium of communication for these four different points. You know, the kind of preemptive framing, diversion, we've seen this. Actually, there was one day in December of 2019, just before Trump got impeached by the House, um, where he tweeted over 140 times in one day. That's just mind blowing. But he's been tweeting um, and you can see every time he's in the press, whether it's for you know uh, Russian relationships or election interference or for dealings with you know Joe Biden and Ukraine and so on, his tweets go up. If oil prices get too low or too high, his tweets go up. So it's almost like you can almost predict a bit of a pattern as to the way in which the president operates. And certainly with the uh, timeline with the US-China trade war, now phase one looks seemingly complete. Phase two is quite key. And what I wanted to show you was this. This is the US election 2020 timeframe. So this is looking at from left to right, January 2020, all the way up to the end of the year. Uh, so the entire 12 months. Now, as you can see here, we, in Feb to June, you have the primaries in the US. You then have the Democratic National Convention in mid-July of 2020. And then you've already got penciled in the presidential debates, which will happen in SEP and two in October of 2020 before Election Day on the 3rd of November. So if you're thinking about it ahead of time, all of these dates will be key. And they'll all be key overlaid then with the meetings between the US and China officials because it's into these meetings where you start to see the tweet activity pick up and accelerate from the likes of Trump and his tweets are market moving. So again, it's a, it's a bit of a science. It's about using uh, maths and backtesting and identification of patterns. It's not guesswork. 
what to be an effective news trader it's definitely not about being reactive it's about being proactive scenario building anticipating think of a hundred meter runner in the blocks and then think of just a guy standing there completely unaware the guy in the blocks bang the gun goes he's off whereas the guy here is in shock looks around then starts to react sees the other guy running off and tries to chase after him meanwhile the other guy is finished that's what it's like when I try to express what it's like trading the news and that's why most retail traders can't do it because they don't spend enough time planning you know the preparation is just crucial in terms of being able to ex exercise a trade in that type of environment or execute a trade so let's move on and uh, a quick run through of setting up Twitter uh, so just go to twitter.com uh, you know I know I sound like a bit of a salesman for Twitter so I can assure you that's not the case um, but set it up and then as you can see here this is this is my account I'll get on to that later but once you have set it up you then want to go to something called tweetdeck.twitter.com now that is a system which basically streams live tweets rather than you have to interact with the platform so it allows you to monitor the tweets live of the people that you follow uh, an easy way of doing this to get your twitter account up and running if you're interested in a macro overview just go on my twitter account and follow the people that i follow that generally will give you a nice flavor although you know rest assured this is not my definitive full list but it's enough to get you going if you go on TweetDeck, then what you need to do is uh, basically organize your columns. When you go onto TweetDeck, you'll see in the top right hand corner of each column is a little uh, settings bar. I would eliminate all columns and then start fresh. So when you click on the plus sign here, when you're on TweetDeck, which is on the left hand side, click on home, select your account, and that will show you everyone you follow. Then if you have any organized lists, you can then select that list. And as I said, depending on what you trade and what you're interested in, you can have different lists showcasing different information and you can build it out from there. Um, here are a couple of uh, other things to be aware of. Here at the bottom, um, Delta One, at 4X Insight, at C underscore Barud and at Noor Homori. Uh, these are four people on on Twitter that have a slightly different purpose. So rather than journalists or analysts or people like me putting out insight and opinion, these guys typically um, copy a lot of information that comes out on major news terminals and then reshare it in an almost instantaneous fashion. So if you were interested in getting news quickly in terms of headline news and you didn't have, let's say, things like a squawk service with the audio coming out, um, then this can be a, a quite a good option and, and a good way of organizing this would be to bolt them into their own separate category to be able to monitor. Um, I know we have a lot of US followers, so I just wanted to go through and talk about um, individual US single stock information. So in my previous job, I did spend a couple of years working on a, an equities desk. So you know talking of single equities was was some common sort resources that we use stock twits was one if you're based in the states you're probably very familiar if not you've probably never heard of them but stock twits is basically the largest social network for investors and traders they got about two million registered members four million monthly messages and what do they talk about well individual stock discussions kind of the stocks in play or in focus of the day prices market sentiment it is quite good to derive uh, determined from the amount of traffic going through people's commentary on certain individual stocks so stock tweets or twits is particularly good if you're looking at that uh, otherwise a couple of other twitter accounts that are worth a shout out which are particularly good at breaking uh, US single stock news so really this is much more based for the guys in New York perhaps stateside rather than the guys in in Europe who are more trading probably the currency market uh, but open outcryer and earnings whispers is particularly good in earnings season gives you nice clarity about the options implied volatility price moves on the back of earnings reports uh, looks ahead for technical setups the day ahead what's coming out in terms of corporate earnings for the week and so on 
Uh, so they're particularly good for real-time stock and option trading headlines, breaking news, um, open outcry is particularly good at rumors as well and hearsay on the street, which you can often get a, a good time advantage on before uh, small cap stocks will see a bit of a pop in price. Um, there are more sophisticated services out there and I just wanted to give these a quick mention. These are the types of services that people would pay a lot of money for. So normally would be used by investment banks or hedge funds in particular rather than your prop trader or your retail trader. Uh, but if you were interested, there's one called Celerity and another one called Data Miner. Uh, both uh, do start to go into the realms of AI intelligence uh, looking at real-time event and risk detection. So again, if you're a hedge fund and you've got literally hundreds of millions or billions at risk in the market, then be able to be an alerted to a certain type of uh, event that is unfolding before it becomes mainstream information you'd pay a lot of money for. So Data Miner is one of those types of services. Uh, it's used by Goldman's, Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse, Fidelity. All the big boys will be using this type of system. But again, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars per month in subscription fees if you were using it. So it's a slightly different level of investor that would have that. Okay, just to finish up then, um, on Twitter, don't forget to follow the, the key members of the Amplified team. So those being Sam North. Sam North is one of our senior traders. He oversees as well uh, the live trading and the risk uh, for the guys on our trading floor and acts as a bit of a mentor for them. Uh, he's much more... Um, based his trading decisions on the technical side of things. So if you do watch our market briefings on our YouTube channel, remember, do subscribe to the channel. Uh, you'll see Sam talking about his setups for the day. Then there's me. Um, as I said, I'm the head of market analysis, uh, and I put out you know useful infographics, thoughts about things that are occurring, Fed decisions, Bank of England trade war, these types of things, the market fundamentals are really key for me. So that's my handle at the bottom. And then our head of trading, Piers Curran, uh, he started trading in 2001. He used to be a part of HSBC. He then worked for Goldenberg Haymeyer in their trading division, a US proprietary trading firm back in the early noughties before then founding Amplify Trading in 2009. He absolutely is one of the people I trust the most when it comes to views on the market. Uh, and so he's also worth a follow when you get time. So hopefully that was insightful. Uh, I've had a lot of requests to do this video over the years. So hopefully it's going to be useful for you and you've enjoyed it. And it's opened your mind to a little bit of the way to view and approach using Twitter to trade and to monitor news. Any questions at all? please do feel free to leave a comment and I'll be happy to, to help further. All right, I'll see you next time. Thanks very much, guys.